All right, I'm still Travis. And I'm still Sam. And we are in January 2021. Mm -hmm. And it is currently and hopefully nearing the end of the coronavirus pandemic. Fingers crossed and hoping good health to everyone this year. So we're thinking it's about time to start moving. We've got itchy feet, we're tired of not traveling, and it's time to hit the road again. I'm going to sit on the back of Travis's motorcycle and join him on his dream that he's had for the last couple of years. I decided I wanted to do a motorcycle vlog to document the whole trip and also just to show people that you don't have to be rich to travel. I mean, we have very basic jobs. We'll tell them what you do. I'm a massage therapist and I massage in the Austin area. I usually massage from home. Sometimes I go to people's houses and I'm really going to miss my clients, but hopefully when we're in Central and South America, I can massage at hotels, maybe even resorts or just people, good company that we meet along the way. As for myself, I'm just your average blue collar kind of guy. I drive a concrete mixer, but for that, it will require a montage. It's hard. It's hard to hear. And it's hard to hear when our microphone And I got concrete on my face. It's been about three or four years now that I've had this in mind, and it's been slowly materializing. We've actually been preparing for, what, a year or how long? Yeah, about a year, year and a half when he told me that we're really doing this, and we decided that for some reason January 2021 was the right, day to, right time period to go for us. So slowly it's just been getting all the equipment necessary, persuading our parents to kind of get on board. They're afraid of... God knows what happening to us. And logistically planning it out because we do own a house. So there's a lot to think about there. We've done a lot of the adult things to get everything properly prepared so we won't come home penniless and just be outright irresponsible having to live with the parents in yeah. our 30s. The Pan American route is something that has always fascinated me. It's the world's longest road stretching down from Argentina all the way up to Alaska. From here, we're gonna start, instead of going down to Laredo and then hitting the actual Pan American Highway, we're gonna go all the way west and then as far south as we can make it. We live in a town right outside of Austin, Texas. It's a great place to be. It's also what we call home. There's nothing wrong with our little home here in this cool town that we live in, but it's time to have an adventure. We welcome every difficulty that will arise. We know there's gonna be a lot of problems and a lot of people think maybe we're just harebrained buffoons for going to do something like this now. Not to mention we're gonna be around each other for almost a year straight. <laughs> it could be a bit of a challenge, but I think it's really going to make or break us. As far as a long-term trip goes, I have done something similar to this for a few months in the summer, but I was alone. This will be the first time going on quite this far and this long of a distance in time with somebody else. And this isn't my first time um, traveling. I've lived outside of the country, so has Travis, but this is my most extreme form of travel. So, there's a lot of apprehension, but we're gonna give it a go. I think if we just sit around and wait for permission, it'll never happen. So we're gonna go and we're going to report and document the trip along the way and let you all know how it is. I've watched a lot of different moto vlogs of travelers and a lot of them had a lot of great highlights and things that they would cover. However, one thing I noticed that most were missing were the historical aspect 
some of the people. You can't really say you know a place unless you meet its people. And with its people come its history, its language, its culture, its expressions, its everything. That's what makes the place. So why not talk about Texas? The time calls that we discuss none other than the Texas Rangers. Texas, 1934. Texas Department of Corrections is humiliated after sociopaths Bonnie and Clyde and another partner in crime jailbreak gang members from Easton Prison Farm. This act precipitates the director of the prison system to commission a seasoned lawman to bring their crime spree to its fatal end. The man chosen has a reputation of Texas tall tale proportion. Only in this case, the tall tale by the name of Frank Hamer happens to be true. Hamer's resting place is in Austin Memorial Park Cemetery. In his life, he'd been left for dead four times and carried up to 16 bullets in his body after being wounded 17 times. He was notoriously hard to kill, facing down cattle rustlers, arms smugglers, bandits, bootleggers, and the KKK. He brought law and order to oil boom towns, collected $5,000 in banker's reward money for every dead bank robber delivered, hunted down and killed Bonnie and Clyde, and a personal favorite of mine happened when he was 64 years old. In 1948, two armed groups faced off over a hotly disputed Senate race between Lyndon B. Johnson and Koch Stevenson. The 64-year-old Hamer exited his car and casually strode over to one group and simply said, Get! They immediately left. He calmly told the other group to fall back. They did so without a peep. Hamer was from the hill country of Texas, where the demographics were much different than those of East Texas. The hill country was mixed with an assortment of blacks, Mexicans, Tejanos, Comanches, Apaches, members of other tribes, Germans, Czechs, and Poles, Scotch, Irish, and the English just like Hamer's family. East Texas was black and white. Hamer saw firsthand the deadly hostility present in the East. Since the 1890s, it was common to have the Rangers called in to fend off lynch mobs. The worst occasion and a stain on East Texas history was the Sherman Riot of 1930. Hamer had saved 15 people from lynch mobs throughout his career. Unfortunately, Sherman, Texas, was not one of those successes. Hamer said he shook the dust off his shoes and never went back to that town. Many of the cases in those days required ranger assistance in delivering defendants safely to the courts rather than falling victim to the predations of a mob. Hamer believed everyone was equal under the law and everyone deserved their fair day in court. He would go to great lengths for it and it wasn't easy. He once found himself on the other end of a manhunt in July of 1908, he was traveling to Beaumont to testify in a case when he arrived to the train station. A 2,000-strong mob was in a frenzy. Not knowing what took place, Hamer offered his help to the sheriff in dire straits. Hamer was told of two suspects in custody for the rape of a 13-year-old girl named Ida Bell Hopkins. Eyewitnesses in the black community had told the county police that the rapist was a man by the name of Claude Golden, a repeat sexual offender. The mob had already left a wake of burned black homes, businesses, and an innocent dead man behind them in their blind hunt. The mob was at the train station because they knew the suspect in custody had been smuggled out of the jail they descended upon and were being hidden somewhere in town. If the perpetrator were to see a fair trial, they had to get him out of town first. In the meantime, the sheriff was hiding two suspects in his barn. Hamer was taken to the barn to keep guard over Golden and another teenage suspect since the police were too busy with the mob. The gravity of the situation must have hit the suspects when they saw a Texas Ranger enter the barn. Hours passed, then the unmistakable sound of the mob grew closer. A vigilante entered. They were absolutely silent. Hamer knew he had to get them to safety quickly. The buggy would be too loud and would stir attention. He knew the only way out was through, inch by inch. Running, or even walking, 
would be too much noise, so they crawled through the mud. The sheriff and a detective returned and joined Frank and the other suspects handcuffed together as they trudged their way through the marshy woods. The mob were privy to them being outside the town somewhere in the woods. With lit torches, the rifle-wielding mob took to the East Texas wetlands. When the mob grew near, the lawmen and the suspects held their breath and tried to make themselves one with the swampy ground. When clear, they resumed crawling. It lasted all night. By daybreak, they'd crawled inch by inch to a church where they were later transported to safety in Galveston. In the end, the victim regained consciousness and identified Golden as the man who raped her. He was tried, convicted, and sentenced to death. He was hanged months later. The teenager, Matthew Fennell, was admonished of any charges and free to go, much thanks to Hamer and the other lawmen. Hamer's captain recognized his coolness, courage, and his outwitting of the lynch mob. He was highly commended for it, something uncommon in those times. Hamer's record wasn't without blemish, of course. Sensibilities of today don't smile at the darker portions of his past. His virtue is what earned his place in the Texas Ranger Hall of Fame. It is that which we commemorate. What's interesting about the famed Hamer is that his life straddled the modern day and the romantic era of Ranger lore. As a boy in the 1880s, much of the day was characterized as what we'd see as the classic Old West, where survival hinged upon the ownership of a horse, a rifle, and a knife. Hamer carried with him that rugged spirit of the Old West into modern times. He also had humility. He eschewed the limelight, turning down large sums of money for interviews for hunting and killing Bonnie and Clyde. He was disgusted by the fanfare. To him, the murderers were sick, subhuman types of people. The vast media coverage and subsequent fandom were a sign of how perversely times had changed. The Old West lived deep within him. Walter Prescott Webb designated Hamer as one of the three most fearless men in Western history. By my estimation, one of the other two would be found during the 1830s, when Texas was a free and independent republic. Adopting new firepower and tactics, he struck fear into the hearts of his enemies and inadvertently tilted the trajectory of what we now call the Wild West.